All right, hello, Major Silva. Again, we have uh, our next presentation uh, will be uh, Mrs. Sahar Muhammad Ali. Uh, she's, uh, she's with the uh, Center for Civilians uh, in Conflict. She'll be covering civilian harm mitigation practical tools. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and it's, um, I'm going to try to pause during the hour that or so that we have so we can take questions and it'll be hopefully be uh, more interactive and dynamic. Uh, so I always, sometimes I start out with this uh, photograph um, on the slideshow, on the PowerPoint, because it sort of sets the scenes in terms of the challenges uh, that uh, happened during urban war. This is the second largest hospital uh, in Iraq. Uh, this is in Mosul City. It was destroyed in 2017. Um, over here, how do I do the pointer? Um, over here, you also see some, um, the ambulance. You know, ISIS was using ambulance uh, uh, to transport its fighters, but ISIS had, uh, was hiding in this building was uh, had rigged the building with explosives and IEDs, but there were a bunch of civilians also in uh, the hospital. The civilians were predominantly ISIS fighters, women, women and children. So they are civilians unless they are actually participating in the fight. I remember having conversations with Iraqi uh, off, uh, military officials and the anti-ISIS coalition, and it was a very difficult decision to uh, approve engaging uh, this hospital because it is the second largest hospital in Iraq, and the uh, and Iraqis uh, and the prime minister actually had to authorize uh, approval of taking this hospital down. Uh, I was there in um, I was in Mosul in April uh, earlier this year. The hospital has is still destroyed; it's still not being rebuilt. Um, they're still clearing uh, unexploded ordnance. Um, from uh, this debris, it's all closed up. There are temporary hospitals in the area to service uh, the civilian population. Um, but it just sort of illustrates, you know, the, the high intensity combat against uh, ISIS ended in October, 2017. It's the five year anniversary of the liberation of Mosul last week. But it just sort of illustrates that the challenges uh, and the, the long-term impact of um, war in urban areas when critical infrastructure is destroyed. Uh, and uh, I mean, it just takes a long time to rebuild. So uh, the purpose of today's hour and so is to identify and integrate civilian harm mitigation measures into military decision-making and planning process for urban operations. And, uh, you know, we, um, I'm just gonna go over this very quickly because we are very fortunate to have Colonel Blanco give a very thorough overview on uh, the law of armed conflict on Monday. Um, this is just sort of a recap of it, you know, um, and you know, the prior um, movie that was shown uh, on the Battle of Manila, the documentary, I think also sets up the conversation uh, that we're having right now very nicely because it frames the utter destruction of the city of Manila, 100 to 200,000 civilians dead, the kind of um, uh, weapons that were used from flamethrowers to indirect fire artillery to a white phosphorus, the illegal orders by the Japanese uh, to uh, deliberately kill civilians. And, you know, the law, uh, Geneva Convention that you're all familiar with, the 1949 Geneva Conventions were um, created elaborate in response to what happened during World War II and the horrors. Uh, and it was designed to try to minimize human suffering and a recognition that the means and methods of warfare are not unlimited. So hence we have, um, you know, the principle of humanity, always balancing the principle of humanity with military necessity, the importance of distinguishing between civilians and combatants, proportionality. You know, you do not, you do not want to undertake attack that would cause uh, more collateral damage. So that, you know, the language of proportionality precautionary measures to minimize incidental civilian harm, to minimize harm to civilian, civilian objects. And then I think what I also mentioned on Monday was this, you know, general obligation to take constant care to spare civilians and objects in all military operations and not just attacks. Uh, and, you know, this whole notion of civilian harm mitigation is a very new sort of um, term of art, or I would say it's a way to operationalize 
uh, key LOAC principles. It's, you know, through um, measures, it refers to measures to avoid, minimize, and respond to civilian harm. And I would argue that this is some of these good tools and practices have emerged over the last two decades. Uh, and, you know, now we're trying to adapt some of these civilian harm mit mitigation measures to uh, the urban environment, to urban warfare, to potentially large scale combat operations. And so it, it needs this very multi cross functional whole of unit approach to see what could be the uh, civilian harm mitigation measures uh, that could be um, designed and innovated and adapted to the challenges of urban war. So again, the Battle of Manila really set it out very in, in visual terms what happened. And, um, you know, there are that there's the direct impact on civilians and then the indirect. So we know that even now, these are the things that are happening uh, in, in, um, in armed conflict throughout uh, the world. Death and injury to civilians, destruction of civilian objects, homes, schools, destruction of critical infrastructure, your water treatment plant, your hospitals, uh, gender-based violence, torture, ill-treatment, arbitrary detention, you know, people fleeing um, areas of fighting um, and, you know, you're going through screening sites and civilians can be arbitrarily detained because they think that uh, they're suspicious, uh, they are suspected ISIS fighter or an adversary. Uh, Siege-like conditions where people can be potentially starved. We've seen that in Syria with the Assad regime where they have they created siege-like conditions uh, in eastern Ghouta, and people were eating leaves to survive. Uh, of course, widespread displacement, um, and then the death and injury that comes from unexploded ordnance, explosive remnants of war, and that can last for decades. Uh, and then you have the indirect effects, the second, third order effects, which is family separation. You know, during armed conflict, families do get separated. You have inadequate access to food and water. You have damaged infrastructure affecting transportation routes, electricity, water, telecommunications access. You have lack of freedom of movement, lack of access to medical care, just damage to schools, disruption to education, disease, disruption, financial services, inability, inability to go to court. Um, I remember when uh, in the battle against ISIS, when areas were being retaken, uh, when the the courts were reopened in Hamdaniya, which is outside of Mosul city, in 2017, uh, early 2017. And I remember I went there, I was there the first day the court was reopened. And so the battle was still ongoing. I mean, East, and, East Mosul had been retaken and the main battle was still going to happen in the West side. But I remember going uh, in Hamdaniya the day the court was reopened and I'm a lawyer, so I was very excited, you know, justice. And there were lines of people standing outside, you know, trying to get divorces or getting marriage certificates, you know, like, and, you know, or like trying to report as people were trying to come back, they were trying to report on, you know, the fact that their property was destroyed or had been occupied by ISIS fighters or had been occupied by Iraqi soldiers and, uh, you know, family members had died. And, but, you know, they had this optimism about them, like, oh my God, the court has reopened. So, I mean, you know, wars also disrupt the basic normal functionality of uh, of our daily lives. You know, getting birth certificates is a huge issue um, for uh, uh, families during uh, armed conflict, and especially when it's protracted conflict. And in some countries, if you don't have a birth certificate, you are unable to access education services. You're unable to get a food ration. So there are all of these things that, you know, sometimes, you know, we don't think about, but the, the, the impact is, is there and it can last for decades, depending on the protracted nature uh, of the conflict. Like, for example, in Syria right now, uh, you know, people are still uh, living in tents and the war, uh, uh, you know, there was, you know, the war began what, in 2012 when unarmed Syrian citizens stood up against the regime, Bashar Assad's regime and all hell broke loose after that. Um, so again, you know, it's really important to think through all of this because the toll on civilians is the highest. Uh, and, and I think in that Battle of Manila documentary we saw earlier, it said 100,000 to 200,000 civilians. Most of the casualties in war have been civilians and it continues to this day. So, I mean, uh, my role as an, uh, in an organization, Civic, um, is, is trying to work with militaries and governments to try to see what more can be done from a practical lens through policies, trainings, 
um, to try to minimize uh, human suffering uh, in war. And you know, on the uh, first uh, the, you know, the first two days of this uh, course, it's been really uh, interesting to see. And again, all of the challenges have been highlighted when war takes place in cities, from the terrain, the infrastructure, presence of populations, the munitions effect. I'm not going to recap uh, some of the things that have been discussed um, in detail by um, the other instructors, but I think that each of these things here, you know, the fire sub support coordination, technology, humanitarian assistance, force protection, all the challenges from line of sight obstruction, you know, poor situational awareness because of the urban canyons, your ISRs are not working, the adversary uh, TTPs, which will put civilians at risk, or, you know, they're using civilians human shields, or they're using, you know, um, indirect fire weapons uh, that are uh, causing civilian harm. Uh, you know, soldiers have a very compressed time to think and act. That's also come up in the last couple of days. Uh, and, you know, the challenge is the capabilities of one's own and partner forces, because most militaries are not trained for the urban environment. Um, the partner forces, are, the partners that they're working with are not trained for the urban environment. And nowadays, you know, the U.S. and a lot of NATO forces, including non-NATO allies like Australia, are engaged in partnered operations. Uh, but, you know, in, we saw this in Iraq and Syria, that the partner force uh, doesn't have the same level of training um, and uh, has, doesn't have the same level of approach and understanding of uh, LOAC obligations, but also the challenges for um, to conduct operations in urban areas, think, looking, thinking about the terrain, infrastructure, population, and what are some good measures to minimize civilian harm. Um, and also training. Um, we still lack, I mean, again, based on the research that I've done, and again, this was mentioned earlier this week, uh, most militaries are not trained sufficiently enough for the urban environment. Uh, and the reason why I have this slide is because there are issues, the challenges from a military perspective to engage the military objective in proximity of civilian, civilian objects has huge implications uh, on the uh, tactical choices uh, that militaries make on how to determine which munitions to use. Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of um, um, research or sort of evidence that we've seen on munitions effects. Uh, we're seeing it now daily, uh, what is happening in Ukraine and the kind of munitions that are being used, especially these, um, you know, Use, you know, they reportedly use of thermobaric bombs and heavy artillery and multiple uh, 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 barrel rockets, these grad rockets. And you've seen those images. I mean, they are, they are lethal. And when you're using them in a densely populated city, the toll on the civilians and the infrastructure is enormous. And, you know, we're seeing it in live stream every day, the images coming out of Ukraine, but they've also been used in Iraq and Syria, and also thermobaric bombs were also used in Afghanistan. So, uh, you know, um, Russia is not the only one that has used these kind of weapons in populated areas. So my job has been to raise awareness on these issues and think what more can be done to both meet uh, the legal obligations uh, under the law of armed conflict, but also, you know, for a soldier to be more effective and thinking through what the risks to civilian civilian objects are so that he and she can be prepared to um, uh, um, take make the right uh, have the right munitions have the right resources and 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 the commander supporting the soldiers at a tactical level to make good decisions because again we've heard from our um, other from the other instructors how uh, the urban fight, people will be in small tactical units and there will be a lot of issues with command and control. You're not going to go to your two-star, your four-star to approve every author uh, authorization for fires. So you're going to have your tactical units making those decisions. So again, knowing law, knowing policy, ethical decision-making, knowing from a practical lens what the impact is going to be on civilian civilian objects with the choices that you're using and the munitions that you have available uh, is really, really important. Uh, and again, I'm not saying, and, and you know, this came up a little bit on Monday that, you know, indirect fire weapons are uh, per se uh, illegal because um, uh, IHL, the law of armed conflict, doesn't specify that these weapons are illegal, but the these explosive weapons with wide area effect when they're used in populated area, can result in indiscriminate attacks because 
uh, of the of the nature of these kind of weapons because they're not they don't land at the target at the military objective directly. So there are ways that, and I know advanced militaries try to in the weaponeering process. There can be ways to you know to, for, during the fusion and calibration of these weapons, you can try to reduce and the warhead that's being used. You can try to reduce the wide area impact uh, of these weapons to be compliant with law and to uh, minimize human um, the, the toll on civilians. And so we uh, sort of at Civic um, sort of use, again, spending a lot of time with, the, with different militaries and, you know, you guys like your little graphics and this and that and before, during and after operations. So um, we sort of adapted this sort of approach of, you know, in the first phase, prepare and plan what you would do during the operations, like employ and assess, respond and learn, and I'll break it up a little bit. But I know this week we are focusing on the, uh, the planning phase. Uh, but again, and I think it's so important that during the planning phase, the all of the challenges are identified, and then that also drives the resources, the training, um, and the preparedness for the soldiers. Uh, and for the commanders. And, and, and I would advocate uh, that we would like that civilian harm mitigation be integrated into all the war fighting functions uh, in terms of the, the two, the three, the five, the training, the seven and the nine and the lessons learned because there's so much we can do. If, if, if that is integrated in all the war fighting functions and not just left to the, the, the civil affairs team, then you are actually then driving proper resources you are, you are, then everybody feels, the entire unit feels that they are fully prepared and know how to operate in this very, very challenging environment. So in the before phase, you know, you know, how do you create a protection mindset? This is not about counterinsurgency or counterterrorism. This is just should be a commander, an ethical commander, an ethical soldier wants to ensure uh, that uh, minimizing civilian harm is an essential part of uh, every soldier's uh, rule of engagement. Um, and so you need to create that protection mindset. You need to include that in your doctrine, your training, uh, and trying to identify what are the good practices uh, uh, to, on civilian harm mitigation. And again, some of these good practices have come from Afghanistan, from Iraq. And now how do you adapt them to uh, large-scale combat operations or high-intensity urban war. Uh, and we've seen in uh, the, the two recent um, um, operations in Raqqa and Mosul, which are considered as LISCO, uh, uh, that some of these good practices and tactics that were um, have been identified were not scaled up uh, appropriately uh, when 100,000 uh, soldiers are fighting in a city. Fine, most of them were Iraqi soldiers with coalition support, but uh, some recent studies, including by the RAND Corporation that came out um, on Raqqa, which looked at the coalition uh, working with the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, the SDF, uh, that, that there were, um, there's a lot of widespread destruction. Um, I think the casualties were around 9,000 to 13,000 civilians died. Uh, I think in Mosul, you're talking about nine to 10,000 who died during the operation. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the lessons from those two conflicts, which are the most recent ones where the U.S. has been involved and NATO countries have been involved, um, shows that uh, the, more needs to be done to adapt um, your training, your policies, your tools, your, re your munitions, uh, your how you work with partner force to train them on these good practices and adapt them to the urban conflict to LISCO. Um, and again, as part of your planning process, you know the proactive planning to avoid and address uh, civilian harm. I think it's very important to just mention that quickly. And Colonel Blanco mentioned this on Monday. You know the the, the at least in the U.S. Um, in 2020, um, the Department of Defense. Um, issued a uh, Department of Defense instruction on civilian harm. It's being finalized uh, earlier this year, Secretary, in response to the New York Times uh, reporting on civilian casualties in Iraq and uh, Syria. Uh, um, and the um, Secretary Austin issued an, um, um, a policy, it's called, a, and there's, an, uh, there's a lot of work being put into it, it's called the Civilian Harm Mitigation response uh, policy, the CHIMRAP, it's a terrible acronym, um, uh, 
Um, and we haven't seen it as yet, but Congress is very involved uh, on this particular topic. There has been uh, there is a, a resources being allocate, allocated to develop a center of excellence to learn about civilian harm and how to adequately prepare, uh, at, at least in the U.S., uh, the military to uh, try to minimize civilian harm. And also, when harm occurs, how do you what what is the response of the, of the government, the military, to acknowledge? when harm occurs, even if it's not seen as a violation of the law of armed conflict, but it's seen as incidental harm. Um, and again, in the preparedness phase, the appropriate policy, the rules of engagement, the SOPs, um, and this last thing over here, the creation of a mechanism uh, to track, analyze, and respond to harm. So this tool was uh, used um, by ISAF in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I remember, you know, back then in 2007 we would be going to the isaf commander and saying you know 80 people were killed in azizabad or 90 people in an airstrike and you know the isaf and the us did not have their own data on civilian harm because they were not tracking civilians who were being killed or injured so this led to uh isaf being very embarrassed by uh you know publicly um and then there was this um initiative to tr try to get the military to include uh, um, death and destruction and injuries during military operations. Of course, militaries conduct battle damage assessments, but th those look at the impact on the military objective. They don't sufficiently integrate um, the impact on civilians uh, and civilian objects. So this tool was created um, and it led to a creation of civilian casualty mitigation team, which basically led to all this analysis coming in uh, all the civilian harm incidents were being fed into this database. You had experts looking at the data, analyzing, and then seeing what the trend lines are. Like, what are the root causes that led to uh, civilian harm? So it was like, oh, yes, airstrikes being used in residential areas. So General McChrystal then issued a, a tactical directive to limit the use of airstrikes in residential areas. Um, in Iraq, for example, General Corelli saw that... Um, uh, a lot of uh, Iraqi civilians were being killed at checkpoints when they started getting this data and then they saw, then they enacted new SOPs on escalation of force. So, so I mean, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with some of this and you're like, oh, we already do this, but it took a lot of innocent people being killed in Afghanistan and Iraq and um, for this change to happen. And for, but again, you know, credit also goes to the leadership of uh, at that time recognizing that there was a void in their own data and that they wanted to change it. So again, this tracking uh, uh, mechanism is can be really useful. And it was used by the anti-ISIS coalition. You know, I was down at CENTCOM, you know, advising them on trying to create this back in 2014. And then it was pushed down to Baghdad and to Kuwait um, at the command centers there. But the problem uh, there was that it wasn't sufficiently scaled up to large-scale combat operations. So uh, the data that um, the coalition has is very different from the data that was being independently reported by NGOs and journalists. Uh, so you know the data coming out of CENTCOM was like, oh, we you know a thousand people died, whereas externally, you know nine thousand people. It's also because you know the military does not conduct and goes to the site and conduct its own investigations and assessments, whereas NGOs, journalists are there on the ground and can do and can actually speak to witnesses. So it's very important that this tool that's created for an, uh, an urban conflict is leveraged enough that you're not only looking at your internal data coming from your own internal reporting from your, uh, you know, when the plane lands back, uh, at the base, whatever, and you're looking at the video feed, but you also are trying to you create a mechanism where you have protocols where NGOs and journalists can report information and with GPS location to the military. So you have both external and internal data, or civilians can even you know feed data information into a website so that it improves the analysis for the military. And I think that this can also be a very useful tool to also counter all the disinformation that's out there. Uh, um, um, and if it, again, if it's resourced properly, if it's leveraged properly, and again, you know, I'm I'm also uh, uh, for me having evidence, or you know, I'm sure for all of you, going to the commander and saying this is the evidence you have will help make the case for the commander to uh, look at the issue and uh, you know think about new tactics, 
new techniques that should be uh, adjusted given uh, the challenges in the urban environment. And we all know, and we have seen that this has been, like I said, deployed pretty effectively in um, Afghanistan and Iraq, and it did lead to revised policies, ROEs, um, and it also led to reduction in civilian harm. Uh, so the other thing I know we've talked about, um, sorry, the, let me just bring it down a bit. I know, the, the, again, we had such a terrific um, session yesterday um, focusing on IPP. Actually, before I move on, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah. How do you think the media influenced the development of operations? If social media had existed, do you think that many civilians would have died in the uh, that's a very good question. I, I think that uh, social media and independent reporting uh, has such a strategic effect on any military operation uh, that I think maybe it could have, you know, uh, led to some different changes and tactics and munitions that that would have been used. I mean, we saw we saw it in Iraq as as well when um, the um, when uh, over 100 people were killed um, in as one airstrike in Mosul al Jadida that uh, it was widely reported and there was entire pause in the operations for uh, a couple of weeks actually. Because, the same, thing. same thing, yeah, exactly. So it does have an effect and because again, the tactical choices and it, this is something that's come up a lot the last few days, tactical choices made do have strategic effects. And you know, uh, countries that really value, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, being in compliant with the law of armed um, conflict, you know, Colonel Blanco talked about the, the ethos, ethics, honor is a big component of the U.S. military. Um, you know, ethical soldiers, ethical commanders want to do right. So I think that uh, it is, um, I think, you know, I think that's why I think it's also very important that this information comes out sooner because then that does, that can change uh, the choices that a commander would make to change their strategy and tactics and approaches. Any other question? Oh, population centric IPB. Yeah. So, um, and again, there's been so much, um, you know, yesterday we got a lot of information on IPP. There was an exercise and, you know, the IPP is usually used like, okay, where's the enemy? Where, you know, what's the kill chain? We're going to go after the, the adversary. And that's how it's designed. Um, and what we are trying to do, and again, I am really heartened to hear some of the conversations by my fellow instructors who are constantly mentioning, well, you need to know where the population is. You need to know where the terrain is. You need to know where the infrastructure is because it is really important to have that analysis in the IPV phase. You need to have a population-centric approach to intelligence gathering. And again, there's been a back and forth because that is seen as a vestige of coin, of counterinsurgency, you know, you are the hearts and minds of civilians. And uh, I mean, I don't know, I would argue that um, knowing where civilians are present, knowing what the munitions impact on infrastructure is going to be, where essential services will be degraded and the civilians won't have access to food, water, uh, um, is a problem from an operational lens. And, and uh, so you should know that it's not about being pop this is coin and now we're not in coin, it's about practicality and being pragmatic. And you wanna make sure that the soldiers empowered, the commanders empowered with the most amount of information to make the right decisions. Uh, even if you're going pretty fast and shot for, and I know those are the buzzwords these days. Um, and there's so much that can be done uh, to better understand what are the threats to civilians? Because you know, we know, we've seen it in all the recent conflicts and even going back to Manila, the adversary is going to target civilians and is going to put civilians in a situation that mass casualties can also occur. So what is your responsibility as an attacking force? Or what is your responsibility in defending a city where civilians are present? So really knowing how civilians are going to, what are the threats to civilians? Um, which civilians will be more uh, vulnerable because of their age and gender um, or disability and how you can try to um, see whether they will be able to move from an area or not when you're thinking about trying to encourage civilian population to leave. Um, you know, also understanding how civilians will behave in a very dynamic environment where, and again, I'm looking at Mosul and Raqqa as the most recent conflicts where we there were missed opportunities where they didn't really foresee in the targeting process how civilians are going to react. 
Um, and, and the Raqqa report from RAND, it really identifies some of those challenges. Uh, again, looking at patterns of life before and during operations, sometimes, um, you know, again, you're going to have degraded ISR in an urban environment with the urban canyons fighting against near peer. So, you know, what are the alternative sources of information you will need to know how civilians are going to move around? You can't just be having your drone surveillance drone area because you may not be able to have access to that. So you need to speak to anthropologists. I mean, again, this came up the other day in the conversation. You need to speak to NGOs that are on the ground in that area. You need to speak to anthropologists, cultural uh, uh, people, you know, religious communities, etc., in the preparation phase to better understand the the nuances of that particular population, uh, which is going to be, which may be different. I mean, I mean, right now a lot of the conversation is is around, you know, the U.S. and NATO coming in defense of the Baltic states. Um, or in defense of Taiwan. Uh, so again, Taiwan and the Baltic states are not the United States of America. So there are cultural differences. They are, you know, I, I remember even in Afghanistan where, you know, digging, because it was so hot, you know, they would irrigation, they would dig, you know, make irrigation ditches at night. And it was seen as, oh, they're planting IEDs. And then you would drop a bomb on them, you know. And again, innocent farmers were killed. So knowing cultural practices is really really important and also knowing displacement patterns um civilians will try to you know again they have agency they will try to move when they are ready to move um and i know in iraq uh in rock and uh, mosul the i actually went through this i went through the mouse holes and we've talked a lot about urban fight is going to be you know through those mouse holes um and isis created them to hide from ISRs and from coalition and Iraqi um, attacks. So they created these mouse holes. And it was pretty cool. I went through like, I don't know, five buildings. <laughs> you know? But civilians started using them too, because once the ISIS left that area, they're like, oh, there are ISIS fighters here, coalition airstrikes happening here. So we, we're gonna use these mouse holes to go through buildings. So, you know, and then civilians will move to any abandoned building. Uh, so. Therefore, in the pre-strike assessment, et cetera, you really need to know, try to get the best information relying on your human intelligence, your signals intelligence, your open source intelligence about where civilians uh, will be moving around. Uh, and again, if you're working with a partner force, you'll be able to also learn from them. But I also would advise that partner forces sometimes have their own agenda too. And we've seen that, especially when it comes to targeting uh, Colonel Blanco. You can correct me, I'm sure you know that too, where uh, partner forces sometimes have their own agenda in approving strikes, etc. cetera. Um, we've seen that in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then the other thing is that also like uh, anal uh, analyzing, like how long will civilians survive? How long will their food, water last? if an encirclement takes place uh, because then you know you need to sort of make that assessment too and if civilians have to be evacuated you know you have to negotiate with the adversary and you have to also give space for the neutral humanitarian organizations to come in to um uh to facilitate evacuation and provide food water shelter so there are a lot of things that um that sort of goes into this and i've um I've written this uh, uh, briefing paper, which is pretty detailed. And, um, it's in your packages, et cetera. I know we had hard copies here, but it, it has a lot of questions uh, in the prepare and uh, plan phase on how do you understand civilian behavior? How do you understand where critical infrastructure would be? What would be the, even the consequences of the cyber attack on infrastructure? What should happen? Uh, you know, what would be considered the effective warnings? You know, again, the law of armed conflict says um, if it's feasible, you need to give effective warnings to civilians so they can seek safety. And we talked about it a little bit on Monday. Um, uh, but what would be considered as effective given the cultural language, gender, age perspective? Um, so those things as well need to be considered. The other issue is if you're also thinking in. Uh, um, yeah, so they'll just stop. So there's a, just a lot in this report on thinking through that. I took uh, these photographs. This is from Syria at the bottom. And the, this were these kids. This was in uh, northern Iraq in Zumar in January. I was there in January 2015. And I mean, you can't really see. It was a completely destroyed town. Just the look of sadness on their faces. 
I mean, I have kids and it, it's always very hard when I see the kids. Um, just the look of sadness on their face was, was something that um, it really, I just had to pause and I chatted with them. Um, so here, um, you know, thinking through some of the operational planning, like again, identifying risk to civilians, you know, putting protection of civilians in your commander's intent. I have to get, uh, you know, people are like, why do we need to do that? This is not coin. I have seen that if you don't put, I mean, well, I would argue that if you put it in your concept of operations, in your commander's intent, it's going to drive the resources. It's going to tell the unit that yes, civilian protection is as important as uh, engaging and degrading the adversary. And I've seen that if you don't put that up high, they, they won't be enough resources driving the harm mitigation. Um, you know, we did a tabletop exercise with the uh, Naval War College in May, Civic did. I was there and we were doing a run through. And uh, I think I was sharing this anecdote on the sidebar uh, last couple of days. And, uh, you know, at one point there were, it was like a, you know, Taiwan type situation, whatever. But one was like, okay, the adversary had taken over this one tiny island and the population was there. And the SEAL team was going in, you know, to, to, and they're like, oh, we're going to blow up all the bridges. And, and then I was listening and then it was, okay, so wh what about how you can get food, water to these people? There, there's no way to, for them to get out. They're like, oh, that's phase four. So I was just like, uh, okay, so people are going to starve in the process. And then they said, oh, it's not in commander's intent. And I said, my reaction was, wow, you really need that to be in the commander's intent? for you to think through the second, third order, or actually in the direct effect of probable starvation if you, you know, blow up all the bridges of an island and there's no way, and not thinking through how food or water or medical is going to get in. So um, I think maybe, you know, at least for the some militaries, putting in the commander's intent is important. Again, thinking through the munitions choice and the impact it's going to have, you know, consulting urban experts. And yes, there are... Uh, you know, some of the experts around here, but I'm when I think of urban experts, also the engineers, you know, from let's say from Raqqa or Mosul City, as an example, or from any of the Baltic states, you know, speaking to the engineers in those areas who can give you the maps of where the sewage is, where the underground pipes are, you know, in Mosul, they didn't do that. And, you know, the so when some of the strikes or airstrikes were taking place, there was a lot of flooding and sewage. Um, so, you know, getting those up-to-date maps, talking to the engineers or technical experts from that city in helping your planning process will, again, make better decision-making to the commander, to the to the uh, targeting folks uh, and the choices of weapons to make. Um, and again, there's been a discussion on, you know, knowing the structure, uh, the thickness um, of the building, right? Um, if it's how thick is the concrete or is it a mud brick building, but you know, how thick is the concrete and what is the appropriate munition effect to penetrate that building? Uh, and can you just, you know, and again, the U.S., I know, and NATO forces have done this, where they use a low collateral ordinance uh, munition to take out a top floor, which is from a harm mitigation lens, that's really important. But again, ha speaking to people from that city and really knowing uh, how the buildings are uh, built will help in making all of these choices. Coordinating uh, with the coalition, this came up the other day on Monday, some of the challenges with interoperability of intelligence sharing, et cetera, that definitely has impact on civilians. Um, building defenses, I mean, you may think from a defensive, and, and if you're defending a city, what can be done to build defensive, uh, you know, defense of a city? Um, how are you prioritizing and resourcing? How are you assessing civilian harm? What are the tools that are necessary? I'm, you know, again, having your post-strike assessment SOPs and your forms uh, sufficiently um, uh, written up so that everybody can fill that out. If he goes into the civilian casualty mitigation team, this tracking cell, and then, you know, the analysis starts coming in over why, what happened. That could also be useful, you know, in, at least in the U.S. military uh, perspective, if the commander decides to do an AR-15-6. Um, and then lessons identified integrated in a timely manner. So once you start seeing trend lines of why civilians are being killed or why this uh, infra this IED factory was blown up, but the secondary explosion um, uh, killed 80 uh, internally displaced people, okay, you do the analysis why that happened. And then you saw that in the pre-strike assessment, they did not sufficiently look at the area and who was in the buildings near the IED factory. 
And so these kind of lessons, and again, it goes to resources. How could, you know, these lessons have to be identified in a very timely manner because it leads to real time decision making on the tactics, choices, training during the fight. Um, so therefore, you know, having the, the two, the three, the seven talking through all of these issues is very important. Um, you know, there's been some discussion on information operations. There's a lot of disinformation, misinformation that's out there. How do you counter that quickly? Be first with the truth, including when you make mistakes. You know, we talk about effective warnings, negotiations, uh, targeting SOPs and deconfliction. Uh, there are huge challenges in uh, targeting SOPs uh, and the whole, you know, um, and yes, the, you know, uh, again, a lot of NATO countries, the U.S. has no strike list, et cetera. But if you saw the recent uh, incidents that came out out of Syria that New York Times reported on, um, you know, there were all these restrictions. Some people were abusing, uh, you know, the, the, the self-defense, right? So, I mean, you know, most militaries allow uh, more permissive use of fire in self-defense. But it's turned out that this particular special forces team was using it, was abusing that. So what are the, what in a dynamic environment, you know, in deliberate strikes, you can do all the planning, you have time, but in the dynamic environment, you have hour to engage. What, what can the legal advisor, what can the, the J3 guy come together and get, give the most amount of information to the target engagement authority, and, but also vet and red team the information that's coming? in a short amount of time. So thinking through that is really, really important. Um, I mentioned deconfliction, and I know I think we're going to discuss that a little bit with the civil affairs team. You know, all the humanitarian organizations that are neutral and not affiliated with any military are providing humanitarian assistance in their environment. You have to deconflict them so you don't bomb their vehicles. Um, unfortunately, in Syria, for example, and the Assad regime in Russia, there was a deconfliction me mechanism through the UN OCHA. And they would provide the GPS coordinates to the Russians and the Syrians, and they would use them to bomb the humanitarian convoy. So there is this abuse as well. Um, uh, so you know, how do you build trust um, with humanitarian organizations so that their that their neutrality is respected uh, and they are not going to be uh, targeted? Um, you know, knowing all the different protection actors, studying enemy TTPs. I, I think that there's just I found. In my humble opinion, I found that there's just not enough analysis on how the adversary tactic is going to cause civilian harm and casualties. And that also needs to be integrated. I think anything about essential services, you know, like if they are offline for a little while, how soon can you get them back on? I know when um, Russia, um, you know, blew up and I think it was Assad regime, both, you know, some water treatment facilities in Syria, you know, so the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, that is a you know big humanitarian agency organization that I'm sure you're familiar with and have come across them uh, on the ground. You know they quickly deployed to provide you know uh, chlorine tablets quickly so that people get uh, water. But you, as a military unit, if you are there it, uh, and the essential that particular water treatment facility was taken offline through your operations, you know you should be able to have that information and quickly, you know, have on hand, you know, quick things to get clean water to people. Because if you don't get clean water, it's going to lead to disease and all of the second, third order effects from that. Rubble removal. So I know there's been discussion on bulldozers and as an effective uh, 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 tool in urban war uh, for the military, but it is so important to have rubble removal equipment for civilians. I remember I was at the OSD policy in the, in the Iraq operation, and I'm like, are you sending bulldozers so that we know buildings are going to get destroyed and civilians are going to get crushed? We've seen this in Mosul. You need to get rubble removal equipment so that people can bury their family members, you know, have a, you know, and they were like, oh, really? Okay. So, you know, it's like something very basic, but I think even like the Iraqi civil defense was like, we need more rubble removal equipment, you know. I didn't mention here, but body bags in Iraq. Oh my God, the smell of dead bodies was just horrific in the blazing Iraqi summer, you know, 55 Celsius, which is what, 140 Fahrenheit. And we were in Mosul and the, so there was ISIS fighters, dead bodies, and there was civilians that were buried in the rubble. And and I remember I was, I, I was talking to the local police, like we don't have dead, we don't have enough body bags. I don't know, the civil defense, they don't have enough body bags. So I was like running around and 
that's not my responsibility, but I was just on the ground and I just went to any of the humanitarian actors. Um, uh, I called up some of my contacts within the coalition at the Nineveh Operations Command. I was like, does anybody have body bags? These, bo you know, the bodies have to be removed. It's going to lead to disease. Um, so, you know, thinking through that is also very important in the planning process. And also, um, you know, again, thinking through uh, UXO clearance, et cetera. So what, one thing was very good in Iraq, uh, I was very impressed that as areas were being cleared and the military is moving on to the next, and we saw this in Mosul because the concept of operations from the Iraqi side said very clearly protection of civilians. So, you know, credit goes to the prime minister and the Iraqis on that. And they work very closely with the humanitarian actors on some of the displacement issues, et cetera. There were a lot of problems also, I'm not saying it was all good, but there was there was good coordination and they were quickly able, and again, the coalition also helped with this, put in the resources to the organizations like UNMAS, you know, the mind clearing one, so that in as shaping operations were happening, so before they even got to Mosul City, some of the areas that had been liberated, they were going in there and trying to clear out the uh, UXOs and explosive remnants of war, at least in the government building, so that because people wanted to come back home. So I thought that was very good planning to get it done soon because the scale of contamination was just enormous because ISIS booby trapped everything. And there was also all the munitions, right, that don't explode. I remember going into this one village and uh, there was a display, a family. They're like, oh, come, we have this big bomb. It was a big bomb it had made in the USA. <laughs> Big rocket, big munition, and they were—they had put an air condition. They had put some sort of crate around it, and they were living there. I'm like, what are you people doing here? Get out of here! You know, I called UNMAS, and you know, and you know, again, not having awareness. So even thinking, facilitating the work of UNMAS so there can be areas that have not been decontaminated. You put markings around there, uh, and you start doing like through radio and leaflets, awareness raising on these kind of issues. Kids not touching these things. Um, it's really, really important. Again, partnered operations, sharing good practices. This is this is an area we're seeing a lot of challenges in. That uh, some of the partner forces that NATO and the US is working with, they are not being taught some of this stuff enough. Like uh, in uh, Iraq, the elite counterterrorism service, which you know in Iraqi CTS. They were trained on urban war, but you know the U.S. Special Forces had been mentoring them since they created that unit. But the other conventional units were not ready for the urban fight. Um, they only got one hour law of armed conflict uh, briefing. The coordination with JTAGs was only done in June when most of the city had been liberated. So there were just a lot of they were not trained to conduct battle damage assessments that take into account civilian harm. And it's just missed opportunity for this kind of sharing of good practices and learning. And I think it's so important. Even the RAND report on Raqqa also says similar things that the SDF were so brave, yes, but they were not trained on some of the good practices on civilian harm mitigation, which contributed to the death destruction uh, of buildings, uh, et cetera. Um, and then again, you know, I know we're not supposed to discuss stabilization, you know, and all that, but. Again, in your planning, you have to start thinking like, okay, as areas are going to get retaken, which security force is going to go in? Who's going to be the police? Who's going to be the civil defense? Is the police going to act lawfully from a human rights law lens? Uh, because you know these people can very quickly become predatory actors, and then, then you know you, it contributes to the cycle of violence. So thinking through that is very important. Um, any questions? Yeah. Um, any experience with a long term contract for demining with NGOs or civil contractors and how they help the stability operations? Yeah, so, I, um, you know, the UN mine agency, and there are a lot of other uh, mine uh, removal agencies that are out there. And it's really important to include them in the discussions uh, from the beginning and to ensure that they have the financial resources to do their job effectively. And of course, the mine, uh, these demining agencies are not going to go in as part of the military unit because they have to keep their own neutrality. Uh, so, but again, you know, governments not mil can allocate funding to them and the, the coordination on the ground with the military and the host nation should be about when they can go in, when it's safe for them to go in. Uh, I think it's really, so again, that planning is really important. 
one thing I forgot to mention, and I'm glad you did, was in Iraq, we noticed that, and again, the U.S. has that, you know, the advanced militaries have an engineering person. You have an EOD, this person on in your unit, whereas in Iraq, they were like, they didn't have it. Or in, in, in Syria, they didn't have, so they were trying to remove these IEDs with their bare hands. <laughs> huge problem so um you know training you know training your partner force uh on these issues before the operation is very important and getting them to allocate resources on eod disposal and all that as part of the the, the unit that's going in is really important um so i have um in this book i have like two different checklists and i'm going to sort of stop very quickly uh so um again this came out of the and I've been trying to do a little bit more research on what are the obligations of defenders uh, to protect civilians from the effects of attack, because Article 57 of Additional Protocol 1 uh, talks about you know, precautions in attack and then precautions from the effects of attack. So the obligation is on both sides, the attacker and the defender. And a lot of the research that we have done and a lot of the policies practices focuses a lot on the attack phase not on the defensive phase um, and there are things that defenders can do uh, to protect civilians from the effects of attack so i have some a section of it written in that report but then i when the ukraine conflict started i put out like this tweet um, so i wasn't like john spencer who put our entire manual but uh, i put out this tweet and he included my tweet in his manual um, um, about, you know, what is a quick thing? And this actually got uh, translated in the Ukrainian and it was widely shared. But, you know, what can be done from a defender's point of view? And again, a lot of times defenders, at least in, in terms of NATO and U.S. operations, recently has been against, uh, you know, going into Mosul or going into Raqqa that is controlled by ISIS. So, uh, but, you know, ISIS also is fine. It's not a government. It's a non-state armed act. It's a terrorist organization. But it also has obligations under the law, um, even though they're not party to uh, any treaty, because a lot of the issues on not targeting civilians and not torturing civilians um, are customary international law. So irrespective of these are, you know, use coercion norms, you know, um, irrespective of you signed a treaty or not. So defenders uh, checklist, you know, issuing commander's guidance at protecting civilians is a strategic, legal, ethical priority. Uh, defenders should avoid locating military objectives uh, in civilian areas or in buildings used by civilians, including hospitals, residential buildings, religious sites. I know I'm reading this. You're like, of course, people won't do that. They do it because, you know, this is a way to protect them from attack. So um, it, it, no matter you know which side of the divide you're on, it's going to happen when things get very tough. A lot of the measures of even ethical fighters and military sometimes is, is a challenge. Um, you know, wearing uniforms and insignia from distinguishing from civilians. And this is, I guess, in the Ukraine context, it was very useful because suddenly you have civilians joining uh, and participating in the war effort. So they started wearing this yellow band, which I thought was really important to distinguish them from civilians. And my colleagues in Ukraine, uh, we, they got very concerned. They're all Ukrainians. And they got very concerned that everybody's going to be lumped in. And so they were talking to communities about making sure you don't even wear brown or green clothes that would seem that you're part of any military. Uh, again, providing timely and effective warnings to civilians about incoming attacks through sirens, social media, SMS, loudspeaker, so that civilians have enough time to seek shelter. Pre-positioning food, water, first aid, and shelters for civilians. Again, negotiating with humanitarian actors to allow them safe passage to provide food, water, medicine, um, and you know, going to the front lines, removing, you know, helping injured civilians remove from the front lines. It's also very important to respect the neutrality of these humanitarian aid organizations. I know this, you know, this came up on Monday. Where, you know, does you know, MSF doesn't like governments. Medicines on Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, is a humanitarian aid organization. They they operate from the principle of neutrality. They don't want to be subject to attack by any side. So they keep. A lot of the humanitarian organizations keep military actors at arm's length, other than negotiating access to the areas. Um, marking protected areas. So, you know, you can put signs on a building. This is a school. It's a hospital. Shelters, not commingling with civilians. You know, in Ukraine, they did put a big sign there on the roof saying this is a movie theater and civilians are present. Russia didn't care and still bombed. So 
but still a defender can still take these measures irrespective of what the other side is going to do that is law unlawful. Um, as I mentioned early marking areas where UXOs, ERWs um, uh, have not been cleared, identifying safe routes for civilians to leave and support the exit out of harm's way. You know, the safe route issue is very challenging. I know in, um, I mean, we've seen that a little bit in, in Ukraine, but I know in Iraq, civilians trying to leave ISIS controlled areas, you know, ISIS was um, um, shooting them uh, when they tried to leave. And, you know, civilians would bribe ISIS fighters to negotiate their way out. Uh, but even these safe routes that the Iraqis were trying to negotiate, I mean, trying to identify, they were not safe from attack. So the safe route issue is very complicated. And again, it's very uh, theater specific, uh, but still a defender should think about uh, these issues. Um, so this thing, providing first aid tips to civilians and distributing first aid and tourniquets. So there was a separate tweet that I did about, again, the stuff that I learned from Syria and Iraq was, you know, like getting first aid kids, getting, you know, some sort of a tourniquet. So, and even if it's a stocking that you could use to stop the bleeding, you know, and the hemorrhaging, um, don't stand near windows uh, and use your cell phone to take photographs of Russian airstrikes. They will think you're like a sniper and, you know, you know, bomb you. And they did that in Syria. So th there were these things that, you know, we'd learned about what, you know, do, put an X on your window pane um, so that the shattering of the glass and the window pane is not as extensive and it can be minimized a bit. So very sort of practical sort of tools, um, you know, that that uh, that a government and military can sort of uh, share with civilians because they don't think this way. They don't think that they're going to be killed or attacked, etc. Civil defense has has fire blankets, rubble removal equipment, water treatment tablets, antidotes. You know, like in Syria, they when they use chemical weapons, you know, the sarin, you know, uh, you know, getting antidotes uh, to civil defense that they could give to the population quickly. Um, training the medical team how to treat wounds, fragmentation injuries, blast wounds. Again, these are the in urban war we have seen that the kind of injuries that civilians and even of course soldiers suffer is just different so there is there and then the way that the is something i learned from iraq and syria was the injuries for adults and the pediatrics are also different like i mean because the bones are different right so you need to have specialized training uh and these uh, these trauma who are you know doctors who are trained in trauma um and emergency uh, uh, response and medical care. And then you have to have separate for adults and separate for pediatrics. I was really heartened to hear how some of the Syrian doctors were, sh were doing online Zoom trainings with the Ukrainian doctors on this, on specifically on this kind of care and the difference between the adults and the pediatrics. And again, thinking through how quickly you can restore essential services as a defender um, um, so that civilian you know, survivability increases. Um, and then we have sort of uh, attackers checklist. Some of this I covered earlier. Uh, one thing um, I didn't I didn't mention today, but I know I mentioned on um, Monday was learning from past op operations. You know, they, it's been great. Uh, you know, uh, Major Giroux uh, talked about some of the past urban conflicts, and he and John have all these case studies on the uh, Modern Warfare Institute on on this and i'm studying past conflicts from the lens of civilian harm mitigation and how civilians were put at risk and what can be done um, and i think it's so important to study these past urban operations and if you can really get access to kind of munitions that were used i mean today in that um documentary we saw in manila it was very open in the kind of munitions that were used and you can see what the munitions effects are again the past can inform a lot how you properly plan resource mitigate uh, and then, oh, you know, thinking about uh, building defenses, et cetera, ditches, berms, walls, bulldozers are very useful. Um, another thing is, you know, I mentioned a little bit, talking to conflict Im impacted communities. You're talking to civilians who are going to go through war is important. You get better informed how you're going to plan it. Um, some of the stuff I've covered in the pre one of the previous slides, but again, this is a handy checklist um, for both an attacker and for uh, defender. Um, and then these are some resources for all of you. Uh, some, um, I've written a lot of these and there, but there's some from the ICRC yeah. that I've also included. The top one is that primer that came out in June that, that um, I mentioned. I wrote this article uh, with a colleague of mine. The, you know, again, this is um, 
this is a, uh, I was asked to write this article by the Texas National Security Review. Um, again, try to push back on this notion that, you know, protecting civilians is a vestige of coin and we don't need this for uh, war, uh, urban war and, and LISCO. Uh, so it's a pretty long article. It's about 7,000 words. Sorry, I got a bit carried away. Uh, but actually I do examine, um, it talks this entire section on the moral welfare of soldiers. And, it, and then I also have the section on training gaps and the cha gap and the fact that some like FM3O, multi-domain operations, FM, they don't mention LOAC or hardly mention civilians, which is, you know, problematic. And I do mention the work of the 40th ID uh, as a really positive step forward in the learning. So I'd recommend uh, using that. Uh, then this uh, commander's checklist to uh, from an attacking lens. Actually, I wrote this article for the ICRC and General Woolridge found out about it. And he says, oh, this is interesting. Come to our urban planners course. So that's how I got to know him. And of course, John also introduced me. Uh, and then this report here is looking at how the Iraqi forces fought against ISIS in urban areas. So really interesting to look at a non-Western military, some of the good practices, policies they had and the gaps. There's a section on uh, the some positive in the coalition training, but also gaps. And then some other reports, et cetera, uh, that could be uh, useful. So questions, comments? Yes, Karen Danko. Um, so I'm interested to know, can you give an example of how it happens on the ground, how you provide that feedback loop to the um, parties to a conflict when they are causing, when they are yeah. unintentionally causing harm to civilians yeah. they don't know about it. So, uh, you know, we try a civic, you know, we, uh, once we know that, uh, um, you know, war is beginning, we try to have meetings, you know, at least, and I'll, I'll give the example of the U.S. Uh, when the, in 2014, uh, in August, when the first airstrike took place against ISIS, you know, to protect um, the Yazidis in Sinjar. So, you know, scrambling, you know, and went down to CENTCOM and and then we started, you know, having this dialogue about what policies, practice on civilian harm mitigation you're integrating, including partner forces. And then you see, so you first you have to, you know, again, um, establish a rapport. They get to know who you are, that you're on the ground. And when incidents were happening that I had access to, or my team had access to, I would call CENTCOM, I would call SOCOM, I would call, go meet with the team in Baghdad and say, we think this is a problem. Um, and uh, sort of share that information. Uh, I think in the in the prosecution of the uh, war against ISIS, um, uh, CENTCOM also created these uh, portals where, you know, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Air Wars, uh, which is tracking all incidents of civilian casualties um, from the air, uh, were sharing information. So they were sharing GPS locations of incidents, whatever, they would submit them in an Excel sheet. And then the CIVCAS team would look at it. But so... But the CIVCAS team was so backlogged, they're still going through all of the incidents, by the way. But again, having it's so important for militaries to establish that kind of contact with uh, the different NGOs, journalists, whoever's on the ground, because uh, again, the way that the, because you need to build, A, you, you, you will always not have enough information, no matter the, you're the biggest superpower in the world. So, and you will not, your information can be biased because it's coming from your human intelligence or your partner force. Um, and your own uh, internal chain of command or, you know, your own military stuff. So having that external feedback is so important. And we have seen it work effectively to change tactics. We saw it in Afghanistan, we saw it in Iraq. And even now, I mean, the fact that, you know, Air Wars, New York Times reporting has led to change in U.S. policy is, I think, positive. And militaries should be open, right? I mean, it took a long time, at least for the U.S. I can, uh, to be open. Like, who are you NGOs? You know, militaries are like, what's your role here? You know, we don't talk to NGOs and all that. And, you know, you know, working with the Iraqis to open the aperture that it is important to have this dialogue with outside the government and outside the military. Um, so to just, again, the information sharing and building trust is important. Other questions? Uh, just comments. Yeah. Same great brief. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, it can be as a British soldier, it can be more timely to give you this information from you. Oh, well, the comments, so well, well, thank I'm you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Okay, well, thanks.